thisiscouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. You're listening to A Quirky Journey, the healthy family podcast with your hosts, Joe Witten and Fuad Kassab. Hey everyone, welcome to part two of the Building Biology podcast with Lucy McCulloch, Building Healthy Homes. Um, I'm really excited to share with you part two. I know a lot of you really enjoyed part one. So much useful information and such an interesting story. Um, if you haven't heard part one, you can go back and listen to that first. So it will make more sense to listen to part two. Um, and I hope that you get lots out of it like I did. If you have any questions for Lucy, feel free to contact her on her Lucy McCulloch Interiors uh, Instagram page or the um, links below in the show notes. Um, she has just recently had her had a baby, um, her fourth child, so it's very exciting. So she's laying low a little, but she is around if you need to message her and I also can answer a lot of your questions for you um, and I can pass them on to Lucy. Thanks so much for listening. Without any more rambling on, I will um, begin the podcast and I hope you enjoy it. Bye. So um, I feel that um, it's absolutely possible to um, detox from this. It, you know, it's, it, it's part of everything, mold exposure, a, a high EMF exposure. All of these things do take some time and determination to come back from. Um, whether you fully you know, recover from it or not, I'm not entirely sure. I, I guess if you have a sensitivity to anything, it's a little bit like tasting fine wines. If you've got a nose for fine wines, you've got a nose for fine wines. If you've got a sensitive, that's a sensitivity at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. If you've got a sensitivity to electromagnetic fields, you'll probably continue to have a sensitivity to electromagnetic magnetic fields. But I think just generally detoxing and um, which comes about through avoidance, hence the turn your Wi-Fi router off at night um, and allow your body to get back on track, I think is, is, is very feasible. Plus all the other things, you know, like spending time in nature because it does obviously help regenerate your cells, get into saunas, um, do some earthing, uh, walk around barefoot, you know, all of those things that help boost your immune system as well. Eat well, obviously goes without saying I'm talking to you guys. I mean, <laughs> um, so, um, so yeah, I do think so, but I really do, you know, I really do feel that avoidance at same with mold and electromagnetic stuff and all of the chemicals is just your best bet. Um, Cause I find it so like scary and upsetting to think of the exposure for my son. And it's mm, like, yeah years living in a moldy house before we were living in that house he was growing at such a rate that he was yeah always in the next size up bigger than every other kid his age and now he's so much smaller and it was it, his growth slowed down living in that house and so it's just like it, yeah it breaks my heart to think what that's done to his growth and development and then being near the EMFs and how that's going to affect his long-term health. And it's, mm, yeah. uh, it's a, just a really scary thing to, I, you know, I think about myself and I don't worry so much about whether, yeah. whether it's reversible or not. It's like thinking about my son. I'm just like, what, how has this affected his, his health for his life? And yeah, but I guess it's not something we don't really have an answer. I hear you. I totally hear you. And I, I get to moments where I'm like, Oh, but I'm, you know, and this is what I'd say to you, you know, what you're doing right now, the way you're eating and the way you're living, he's got all those years ahead to slowly, you know, get back to optimum health. The sad thing is, and I think, gosh, but we weren't exposed to any of this stuff when we were growing up. Um, and we still, I still struggled, you know, there was no electromagnetic stuff. There was no cell phones. Or there, yeah, wasn't true. Stuff. there wasn't the wireless radiation. There wasn't the... Um, you know, I guess there probably was the fluorescent lighting, which we'll get onto in a sec. But, um, you know, I, I, all we can do is what we can do. And yeah. I think certainly the three of us are doing everything we can with regards to, you know, boosting the kids' immune systems. And that's what it boils down to because you need 
one heck of a strong immune system to deal with all of this. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's gallivanting along at a rate that is totally out of control with no one testing it yeah. exactly the same way the chemicals did in the 70s and the 80s. So just boost, boost, boost as much as you possibly can. Mm. Um, and in my case, you know, and your case, try and, because you, especially you, Joe, with the older kids, try to, and I love, 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 love the idea of the new cookbook with mm. the, the, the guide to how to live in the real, in the world by themselves. I just yeah. think that's magnificent because oh, good. that was what <laughs> all really went wrong for me. I went yeah. to school, Same. I kept on getting tonsillitis, I ate white bread and Marmite and margarine. And KFC uh, and McDonald's. <laughs> that was what I um, that's what uni students do <laughs> that's what uni students do exactly. I didn't I, yeah, I, didn't, do ask wine. Was, yeah, <laughs> I didn't do that <laughs> or even worse than wine yeah mm, yeah um, true hardcore disgusting sambuca and ugh. so um so yeah I think that um I think that trying to teach them to go off into the world and continue to look after mm. themselves and not absolutely thrash their bodies around is mm -hmm. a really is the best thing we can do. Um, yeah. And you know, they're, they're, at least yours still little, mine is still little, and I think it's just a matter of um, trying to get them, you know, to fall in love with this idea of living a healthy life and not mm. and not have it be a burden for them. Um, but it's hard because you know they're going to go to university and there's going to be Wi-Fi and they're going to go to somewhere and rent a flat and it's going to be under a cell tower because everywhere is going to be under a cell tower. Yeah. Um, and that's where it becomes important to, I mean, in building biology, we learn to shield the houses, which is going to become more and more important mm. with, you know, 5G everywhere. But well, you're next, not going to be able to do that when they're renting a uni flat. <laughs> maybe you'll have to write the book on how to create a little sanctuary so that when kids go and leave home yeah. they have a little guide <laughs> <That's a very laughs> and for idea. us who are just learning <laughs> that's a so very good idea because there are you know the faraday sort of you know the mosquito nets you can make make mm. their student digs look very balanced that's right there you go how to decorate and protect your exactly. little exactly. your little haven <laughs> so what yeah. would be those things you'd recommend if someone was living near a cell tower, exposed to neighbor's Wi-Fi, things that they can't eliminate. They can turn off their own, but they can't turn off their neighbors. Um, yeah. You know, what, what are the things that they can do to protect themselves? Um, so I think that, um, I mean, what we do is we, so we don't have the Wi-Fi on at all. We have, um, there's, there's a whole load of, um, contraptions on the market where you can plug your phone in so you can have your phone on airplane mode because the proximity to a phone i mean a phone is like a little cell tower and the proximity to the phone is huge so don't keep the phone on your body um you know when it's on keep it in airplane mode as much as you can um and um you know buy one of these 40 50 dollar cables that is a charger and an ethernet plug-in um, if you don't oh. have any, if you don't have any, what are any they called? Thing, Sorry, I haven't heard of those. Um, there's one that's called RJ45, and it's on Amazon. Oh, right. And what, what does it do? What do you mean by Ethernet cable? So you remember we used to? Maybe you're too young, Elise. I'm not sure, but remember we used to always plug in our computers yeah, <laughs> our before we had Wi-Fi. Yeah. Um, that that was plugged in using an Ethernet port. Yeah. Um, so you can like right now I'm talking to you and I have my computer on my lap and it's on airplane mode. So it's not emitting any radiation and I'm not, I'm not connected to Wi-Fi, but I have a cable that is connected to an ethernet port. Um, and my phone is sitting beside me and it's on airplane mode and it's also attached with a cable. Um, so you would have to install that internet in your home to then be able to plug your phone into that to use the internet. You part. just need an ethernet port, but I would imagine that modems if, have it. Most houses have it, and if if not, an electrician. If you have a oh, landline, you know a telephone jack. Yeah. If you have a landline, you'd be the electrician would be able to get an ethernet port from that. That's and how they did. Just have to get it, like, you just have to get an internet account on that landline. That's how mine is. Um, it's, it's an internet account with a landline. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's an internet well, account with a man line. That part I'm not sure about. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. That's, that's how we used to do it. You had your phone, yeah. you had your, your phone number where your internet was plugged in and then your house phone number. Yeah, Sometimes. Or the other thing that people do, and I don't do this because um, we don't um, even have, a, well, we must have somewhere, but is you can plug into the, um, you can plug into your modem, your internet yeah. modem. Yeah. Um, so you, I think obviously you can turn off the Wi-Fi on it somehow. I'm sorry, I'm not a. I I'll mean, have to what? ask Isaac because he knows how to do this because he plugged his, he got this giant cord or something and plugged it into so it's the Ethernet cable for yeah. his computer in his room because he said the go. Wi-Fi wasn't good enough in there and he had a phone jack in his room which he used. I'm pretty sure. I think he was able to do it. There you go. Yeah, and little does he know what help he's doing, giving yeah. himself with that laptop. But he with should just one keep thing, it on right? <laughs> make sure he keeps it on airplane mode at the same time, because if yeah. not, it's constantly searching for a signal. Right, right. Um, and honestly, in that situation, I think at least if you're sensitive or you're suspecting that you're sensitive or you're or you're concerned about you know protecting the kids, which um, hopefully after listening to this podcast you will be. Um, I really would recommend, I'm not an electromagnetic specialist. You can come away with different certifications and I'm a new build consultant. Um, so I'm very focused on the, um, the walls and the, you know, the building itself, the electromagnetic stuff is so scientific yeah. and so complicated. And, um, there are people that are just brilliant at it and I'm not one of those. Um, but I, you know, as you say, you guys have got a pool of, um, mm. super cool building biologists and I really would spend the money if you could to try and just get someone around to help you shield, you know, there's, I know that the shielding paints, um, there's also bags that you can put over the top of smart meters. Um, if, if, if the smart meter, again, you kind of need someone to come in and measure for you to be able to tell you where it's coming from. Did you say um, you had a meter that you measured yourself with the electromagnetic fields? Yeah, I have a little electromagnetic meter and then I have a, um, a wireless radiation meter um, right. that I use that are very simple little tools, um, relatively easy to use, but, you know, then you need to be able to convert them and, you know, mm. understand where they fall on the scale. And, so it's nice to have um, someone professional come and do it. I think, it, yeah, I really think that, I mean, I've been studying this for four years and I still struggle to grapple with the, okay. <laughs> with the um, electromagnetic stuff. So I think if there is a, if there is a worry about electromagnetic, um, you know, over sensitivity or just exposure full stop, then it would be wise to get one of the electromagnetic mm. specialists in. Um, and um, going back to the light, yeah. the lighting, I know yeah. you wanted to. Sorry. Um, <laughs> um, so they, um, well, there's, so there's one other um, field, which I didn't talk about is magnetic fields um, and things like electrical panels um, give off very high magnetic fields. Um, and um, so that's another just tip. Don't have a kid sleeping right on the other side of a wall of an electrical panel. Um, you know, try and keep six feet try away. To, what what do a, you mean by an electrical panel? Sorry. Um, the where you go to turn on and off your circuits. You know when something. Oh, I see. Electric what do you call them? Yeah. Electricity Electric box. Ours yeah. is on the other side of the garage, so that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. So keep, you know, rearrange bedding if need be, so that people mm. are far away. And then there's the very low frequency fields, which are known by the industry as electromagnetic interference, which are caused by fluorescent lights. Um, mm. And they basically, it's also known um, colloquially as dirty electricity, and they can send, um, you know, dirt, bad electricity through the, through the wires and back through the circuits. Um, and then on top of that, fluorescent lights have mercury in them. So yeah, that's, when you drop one, <laughs> um, which you then have a mercury spill. And let me tell you, when a mercury bulb like that is dropped in a school, there is a team of people that come in and clean it up and do a proper hardcore professional cleanup. That it's yeah. serious stuff. I wonder and how much of us have mercury in us because I remember having a bulb smashed, like one of those long fluorescent bulbs yeah. smashed in the yeah. house when the kids were little. And we yeah. just cleaned it up ourselves. That's in the LED bulbs too, isn't it? 
Um, mercury is not in the LED bulbs, but LED bulbs do do the same. They have the same effect as the fluorescent, as in they send around dirty electricity around your circuits. Yeah. Because mm. I've had um, one of them smash in Dylan's room. The LED bulbs should be fine. It's the CFLs, you know, the, the curly ones, the energy saving uh, ones. Yeah. And again, this goes back to the energy saving. You know, mm. who, yeah. who, I think who, you're doing uh, the right thing. You think you're doing the right thing. But what is happening when those bulbs are going back down into the planet? Yeah, exactly. That's mercury going, you know, back in with mercury vapor coming off. It's not good for... It's not I good for the environment. It in and it's not good for them. So, so what um, do you suggest I, for lighting? So we, when we renovated here, we used incandescent mostly um, and halogen. Yeah. It was the two options that we went for. And it, let me tell you, it was quite a challenge finding, you know, under counter or under cabinet um, strip halogen. Lighting. Yeah. Um, but it's possible. And, you know, once you know and you can type in under counter halogen strip lighting, something will come up or you ask right. your electrician to find it. Mm-hmm. It's knowing that in the first place. Um, yeah. And then there's a lot to be said for obviously the light that comes off and you girls probably know a lot about this as well, but the light that comes off, the, the kind of yeah. light that comes off, the, you know, they're not, they're, they don't help our melatonin production and yeah. all of that stuff that we need to be able to regenerate at night as well. Yeah. And so you wear the, the blue light blockers at night. Yeah. I do sometimes. I don't always remember. Yeah. Too. I don't always remember too. I have a couple of pairs around and about, but yeah, Same. I mean, I, I think we all realize at this stage, right, that sleep is the most important thing. We mm-hmm. need it to reduce our inflammation. We're yeah. bombarded by so much stuff during the day. So, yes, I would do anything when I remember. Mm. I would do <laughs> yeah. anything I could to protect that precious sleep, um, mm. whether it's, you know, turning off the Wi-Fi, whether it's making sure I'm not sleeping near mold, whether it's making sure that I'm not lying on a mattress that's um oh that's another one mattress with metal coils in can disturb the magnetic um you know and they can act as antennas for any magnetic fields um so um yeah i you know sleep on a natural mattress make sure that my room is not particularly the bedroom the bedroom being the sanctuary make sure the bedroom is not full of upholstery and chairs and lovely beautiful chairs that have got brominated by retardant foams Mm. in um, because they really never stop off gassing and that foam breaks down. And as it breaks down, every time you sit on it, it releases particulate into the air, which is, um, really, really bad for us to inhale. So, um, so yeah, I do everything I can to try and protect that precious sleep. Um, this is sort of jumping to another question, but we haven't got much time. Um, there was a lot of things that you mentioned there about materials to avoid, what kind of materials do you recommend for furniture, paint, couches? So I would say, and this is, this is the sort of main building biology philosophy is that um, what is, um, you know, stick with nature, the building biology idea that um, biological compatibility and ecological performance go hand in hand is key. And just, stick to everything that you and I and we all know as being natural materials, natural latex for mattresses, natural wool, cotton. Um, I mean, I use, uh, uh, you can use down if you, if you don't have a issue with um, feathers, obviously Mm -hmm. a lot of people do. Um, And we weren't sure whether we did or not. So I ended up using buckwheat hulls Mm -hmm. for all of my cushion fillers. Um, and uh, what does that, how do you find these things? Like I've never even heard of buckwheat, buckwheat hole buckwheat cushions. Holes. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know where you guys would find them in Australia. You'd have to Google it, but it, they're, they're becoming more and more. Is this popular. something that you, you have filled the cushions yourself or you buy them like that? I think you, I filled them myself, but I think oh, you so can. So it's I just think, the normal buckwheat holes that you'd eat. Um, no, it's the shells. It's, it's just the, the shell. like the shaft kind oh, of thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's so I interesting. Think, I think if you Googled them, you would, find, you'd probably find buckwheat hull cushions. I mean, I even have a, a nursing cushion, which is made with buckwheat hulls. Cause of course hmm. they're, you know, 10, at least in the nursing and the pregnancy yeah. world, they, 
there's you know a bit more choice for organic stuff um well, there's a business I'm, for someone if they haven't got them over here buckwheat whole cushions yeah, that's yeah. What, the buckwheat yeah. Groat we eat isn't it we eat the groat and then it's so yeah exactly it's this it's the shell of that yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, i've, I've heard of, recently heard of coconut coir <laughs> mattresses yeah that's my son had one of those in his cot it was coconut coir wrapped in organic wool wow um, and how was that great and they're firm but that's what we're used to now so my my mattress now and our mattress since he's been born in in my actual bed because mm-hmm. that's like we didn't sleep in his cot very much. It ended up just being mostly in my bed. Um, yeah. Is a organic wool, um, like the the covers organic cotton, and then the insides organic wool. So nice. handmade organic wool. Because I've heard latex still they have to use a glue. So and that was actually a really really lovely man that um, his business is actually making the latex mattresses. And I told him I wanted no tox. And he said, well, you need to go with organic wool then hmm. because he said in latex, even, it is very, even, very na- even the natural latex. Yeah. Well, he told yeah. me in the end, there still needs to be some kind of glue. So it was natural latex, but there was some, there's always some kind of glue involved. Oh, um, interesting. That it was very I thought that latex, I mean, I know a lot of people stay away from latex because they react to it. It's, you know, mm. obviously yeah. not an allergen, but, um, but yeah, it's definitely considered okay in the building biology world, as long as you don't have a, you know, personal sensitivity yeah. to it. Mm. Um, so yeah, just all the natural materials, you know, a, um, a, a clay paint. I mean, think how much, Think how much a paint is affecting our indoor oh, air yeah. quality, how much, how much surface it covers. Mm. I mean, the building envelope is important and you don't really want to have a, the idea with building biology is that you keep the houses so that they can, Breathe. you know, the vapor can go in and out. Yeah. And so you don't want any layer of that building envelope to be um, a vapor, you know, a complete barrier. Um, mm. But if you you know, we're making do and you want to just improve indoor air quality, um, use a really nice natural clay paint um, because not only is it totally neutral, but it's also humidity buffering. It's got that ability Mm. to absorb and release um, the way, you know, most paints on the market don't these days. Plasticky Um, kind of paints. Yeah. And obviously it goes without saying, you know, I'm sure you guys have, talked a lot about this you know just no synthetic fragrances they're Mm -hmm. extremely hormone disrupting yeah um clean cleaning products i mean we use um a simple simple you know essential oil cleaner and Mm -hmm. never had it you know they clean perfectly Uh, Mm. vinegar you know alcohol if need be for disinfecting um yeah just stick to the natural what we all know to be natural. <laughs> yeah. A couple, we, we couple sense. sorry, a couple more really quick questions. Um, air conditioners. Do you want to mention? Anything? So yeah. Oh my gosh. I went through such a journey here um, with this house. Um, we, um, I was literally on my way to hospital to give birth to Kian when my contractor for the first renovation called me and said, what are you going to do about cooling? And I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do about cooling. What are you I'm having do a about baby? <laughs> um, and he's like, well, I'm going to put in an HVAC system. And I'd never even heard of that. Um, and I was like, okay. And this house being the incredibly intriguing house that it is, not only was made with poured concrete, but it had radiant heating in the ceiling hmm. um, and water radiant heating. So electric, electrical radiant heating can give off very high electromagnetic fields. But this was water perfect beautiful copper pipes radiant heating in the ceiling which i understand is a bit odd but fine (laughs) still radiant heating and in in putting in the hvac system this enormous ducted system in the attic that took up most of the attic um he basically drilled through the second floor of all of my radiant heating Um, and so the hvac system obviously supplies heat and cold and so he wasn't, con- he didn't think that there was any reason to keep the radiant heating. And, you know, that's just standard practice here. Mm. So in came this system. And I listened the other day to a building science podcast. So there's a group of people called building scientists who, who deal a lot more with mechanics than we do. We try to, we try to let our houses 
work to the best of their ability by themselves. Mm -hmm. And then obviously in certain climates, you definitely need to intervene. But I listened to this guy talking about this HVAC system and how the only way that he could prevent mold growth building up on the coils of the HVAC system, which has obviously got, you know, hot air going over cold um, coils and then the reverse, Mm -hmm. um, was by spraying a probiotic (laughs) solution on it every three hours. What? Or was it three days? That was his experiment. He was just experimenting. Three three days or three hours? And it, 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 you know, he had to spray it on every three hours to prevent oh mold, mold growth buildup. And the mold growth buildup would occur within 24 hours of this machine, this thing working. What? Wow. So then you've got mold. So th- this doesn't exist. No one does this probiotic spray. It's not on the market. So okay. essentially what he's saying is that within 24 hours of turning this thing on, you've got mold growing on the, oh. on the coil. And you're then spreading it around the entire house, which is, again a wonderful green way of cooling and heating your house. Yeah. But it's taking into consideration the, um, well, it's not that one of a green, but it's what they would use because they've made the house so tight mm. that you then need to mechanically heat it and cool it. So anyway, to cut a long story short, we decided because um, I had stopped reacting in this house, but my daughter was still reacting. Once we put that in, I noticed that at four o'clock she was waking up sneezing the minute mm. it would go on in yeah. the winter. And wow. so I thought, oh, I just have to turn this on. So we ended up putting in radiators um, for the um, winter. And then this year, um, in the new park renovation, we put in the mini split air conditioning units, which are the ones that are very close to the, you know, the, do you call the mini splits in Australia? I'm not really sure. I don't have one. <laughs> the, the long, ob, long, oblong, oh, white. Yeah, call them split system air. Yeah. yeah, split system. And so they're, they're the best option for okay. an air conditioning. If you don't, the, the absolute purest is the window boxes. You know, those horrible window boxes. Yeah, yeah. really. <laughs> That's funny. They're, they're the purest because it's coming straight in, right? Oh, yeah. From the outside. True. True. Um, there's no pipes. There's no ducts. There's no place for mold no. to grow yeah. or anything. But the mini splits are good. They have, they don't have flexible ducts. They have a thin, you know, straight duct that goes right out the back into the condenser. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so they would be the best option. And, and they still have to be cleaned each year for mold, don't they? Are they, are they the ones that have to be cleaned? I think everything should be cleaned. Yeah. yeah. Because I've got be. a friend who's a, the one that's studying building biology and they have a business in Melbourne that's all, it's completely natural cleaning business and they go and right. clean people's air conditioners split system. Yeah. Yeah. They've all got filters that you yes, can. Yes, that's what it is. The filters. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And some. Because I think people don't realize that they need to be cleaned and they'll just use them year after year. Right, um, right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, and yeah, so, that's my take on <laughs> cooling and heating. So, tell us about that in your <laughs> ski lodge in Italy because you're yes. obviously that. <laughs> kept nice and warm yeah so (laughs) another like serendipitous moment in my life was we bought this house a pile of stone rubble back in 2007 Um, we were living in Hong Kong and I really needed an escape for the summer particularly with this vascular condition I have I struggle a lot in the heat so we decided to um buy a house in Italy. I managed to convince my husband. We're both French speakers, so it would have made so much more sense to be in France. But anyway, we're only only about 20 kilometers from the French border. And a lot of people speak, most people speak French or some weird dialect between French and Italian there anyway. So you can buy quite nicely. But um, so yeah, we, um, and I look back at that house now and the renovation and just the fact that it's, it's in such a it's in an area where traditional living is still such an important part of life mm. um, and, tradi- and traditional building is part of that. And we had the most wonderful architect who is, um, I remember him saying to me, I don't know what to advise my son. He just, he just bought a herd of cows and he was starting to make cheese. And he's like, I don't know what to advise my son, whether to tell him to really break his balls and become an architect or whether just to, just to have a herd of cows. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so a really interesting guy. And he just, without, you know, this was before I knew anything about building biology, before I'd reacted to our house in Hong Kong, our flat in Hong Kong. Um, And the things that he implemented, this house has meter deep stone walls. Um, So, you know, you've already got everything there. You don't need anything else. You don't need any 
horrible toxic insulation because the stone's doing it. Um, yeah. You don't need to put, you know, paper backed um, sheet rock or blue board is, is what they call it here, gypsum board, which is going to grow mold on it because it's got paper on it because paper <laughs> is obviously something that's loved by mold. Um, and you don't need to put anything. You just, you know, it was the stone walls with a lime plaster and then a, and then a nice paint. And when I talked to him about paint, you know, the paint that he suggested was, was a clay paint. Mm. Um, wow. so, um, so yeah, we, um, and then I was thinking about it the other day. It's the house is built into the mountain, mm. literally against the mountain. Um, and, um, and it's, when you go into the ground floor, it goes down. So it's sort of semi, not really semi underground, but there's about three or four steps down. Um, and it could be, you know, with all that melt water that comes off the peaks and the Alps, it could be super, super, super wet. Um, but what he did was he basically made it a floating house. He put, um, in Italian, it's called a Vespaio, which is actually the, um, Oh my gosh, the word in English, the, the, the hive, the beehive, you know, the little hole, you know, we see all the hive. So he basically did that on the floor using these little stools, little plastic stools. Okay, admittedly plastic. I'm sure there's a more eco version, but um, <laughs> put all these plastic stools. So when you look down on it, it looked like a, a beehive. It looked like the um, honeycomb, honeycomb. Ah. Looked like honeycomb. And then he put the flooring on top of that. Hmm. And so you have a house that's basically, and that's standard practice there. Completely standard wow. practice. Whereas, you know, we would just build on the ground here. <laughs> yeah. Or we, even worse, we'd put a basement in so that when water gets into the house, it floods straight down into the basement. And then we put carpet down in the basement. So that it's yeah. <laughs> just to, <stop laughs> um, up, to mop up the water. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To kind of mop up the water and the, and the dust and everything else. So um, it was just, it's amazing now that I think back at it, you know, these traditional ways of building that thank goodness are still there. Mm. And sure enough, every time we go there, we are all so zen, no sneezing, no anything. I mean, we can go to any Airbnb in North America and my poor baby girl wakes up at four o'clock sneezing. It's just, yeah. we expect it now. And we go to Italy, nothing, no sneezing, no nosebleeds, mm. no, none of the symptoms that she gets in all the other places. Um, so yeah, it's, um, and then with regards to heating, you know, it's just, it would be typical to do radiant heating um you wouldn't do you wouldn't do a forced hot air that seems to be very much i don't know whether that's an australian thing but it's very much a north american thing very american isn't uh, it yeah yeah and it's horrible it's so mm. drying and it is um yeah no it's and it's obviously spreading all sorts of horrible stuff around the air whilst you're sleeping it's falling straight into your mouth from one of the vents above you yeah the um photos of the ski lodge there in Italy are absolutely stunning. Um, so you basically designed the whole renovation? Yep, yep. Together with Daniele, the architect, um, you know, he was very much, at, at this stage, I'd really only worked on, um, you know, flats in Hong Kong mm. where there wasn't too much structural involvement. So he was my structural support, literally. Mm -hmm. um and um and yeah we did all sorts of crazy cool things and um you know it we, we, i really respect traditional buildings and so that i didn't want to do too much to it and i certainly kept it very traditional on the outside um but we did find that given it was built up against a mountain and very close to another house because it's in this little medieval hamlet <laughs> um, oh, no. or a little um, yeah, 16th, sorry, not medieval, 16th century hamlet that are all, there's all these cute little hamlets sort of interconnected and attached mm -hmm. to each other. Um, and um, so they're all built quite close and there's these little piazza out the front, which has got the water fountain and um, which is, you know, like four meters from the house and all the houses are around it. Yeah. Um, so it was a little bit dark along one side and we were trying to turn it into sort of more modern living. So we took out one of the big vaults of the ceilings, which of course, you know, 16th century or 17th century. Wow. Architecture. <laughs> um, but it was fun. We had a lot of fun doing it. And then we put a, a massive eight-seater, beautiful wooden, made by his dad as a um, 
was recently passed, but was a um, beautiful wood sculptor. Mm. And he did, um, he put a hot tub in on the roof. I saw that photo. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, a hot yeah. tub. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a really good place for a gut health retreat. It there is. You go. <laughs> <laughs> We need well, to talk. We need to talk matters. about this. So Lucy, Lucy has had this amazing idea, which maybe you should just talk about that now, Lucy. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we've got five minutes. <laughs> well, it, thanks to you guys, really. I have to say, and your wonderful books and your oh, at least your wonderful knowledge, um, and obviously having the three of us having been on this journey, um, this same journey. Um, I started to look around for um, gut health retreats and couldn't really find any. Um, and I thought, I know two ladies who would be very good at this. <laughs> um, and it's such an amazing place in June, which is when we're planning on um, doing our first gut health retreat, um, which Joe and Elise will be coming over to um, to run. Um, and it's just, it's just it, it lends itself to regenerating um and being in the fresh air in the mountains and learning how to um you know I'm I'm, I don't work I mean I work privately on the food side of things I don't obviously work in the food world but I'm still very passionate about sharing healthy eating and um gut health with Mm. as many people as possible um, and this lovely house is there. And um, so we brainstormed and we thought that it was a good idea to offer it up to people for a couple of weeks in June. So we're now going to be running um, two weeks, one on the 8th of June for five days, well, five day retreats, one on the 8th of June and one on the 15th of June of next year, um, where people can come and learn how to nourish their families and nourish themselves and reset and be in an environment that is conducive to resetting. Um, we, the house is right on the corner of a beautiful national park with, you know, a river flowing through it coming down from the Alps. Mm, Um, June is when all the fabulous herbs and uh, medicinal herbs are all popping up and cropping up. So we're hoping to incorporate some, some of that into the gut health retreat and the um, the learning how to nourish your body and your soul. Um, go to local markets and pick up local produce and learn how to cook with you know what you've got um, locally. Yeah. Um, so yeah, visit the local cheese makers and beekeepers and go exactly. for walks in the exactly. Alps. Yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness. So like much convincing, didn't we, Joe? <laughs> no, we didn't. Really much convincing <laughs> at all. When you called me, Joe, you're like, do you want to come to Italy? I was like, yes. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Done. <laughs> when should we book? Yeah, no, we've got, I mean, when I'm, when I'm there with the family in the summer, we're literally, you know, going from one hamlet to the next, picking up the cheese. Um, mm. There's a, Massimo has actually has his cows that come right down literally into our garden. Um, and um, he has the most amazing cheese place. And we go up there and we get our, get all our dairy. And um, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, there's the, the, the local hunters come by with the venison. If you oh, want venison, yeah. it's definitely, I think it's a good spot for it. So hopefully we'll get uh. some, nice groups of people together every every person i tell about it says can i come (laughs) so guys um we will be releasing um the website for this retreat very soon um by the time this podcast is up the website will be out there um so the link will be in the show notes so you can go and have a look at the photos of the of the lodge of the area um learn about the sorts of things that we'll be teaching and um, all, the, all the experiences that you'll get to take part in there. Um, but basically it's just going to be a beautifully relaxing, calming, healing retreat, luxury healing retreat. <laughs> and we're very excited about it. Yeah, good. So am I. Cannot wait. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was so much fun. 
five and a half months away now. It's going to come around. Yeah. So and soon. then there's so many areas nearby where we were talking about how long do we do the retreat for and get the right balance, right? And, mm. you know, make sure that people don't get over swamped with too much information. And so we were sort of thinking that, you know, if we did Monday to Friday, perhaps people would like to tag on a weekend and we're very near the very famous wine valley um, where Barolo wines come from. If someone has an interest in that afterwards, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. It is a UNESCO site actually. Uh Um, We're a short drive south of France um, if you wanted to go and have, you know, a couple couple days getting a little bit of vitamin D on that's the coast. That's what Dylan and I will be doing. When yeah, that's what we're we'll doing, well. exactly. South of France. Yep, yep, right. yep. And, there's, and Turin, we're an hour and a half from Turin, the city of Turin, which is a beautiful, beautiful, um, very regal city in northern wow. Italy. Mm. Um, we're two and a half hours from Milan. So if shopping and going and seeing beautiful Milan, which has become so hip, right now um <laughs> is your thing then i'm going there on the way home milan and paris yeah. oh it's so cool so Love cool to. or exactly as you say you know like your hop skip and a jump in it's, paris london yeah. um portofino is such a cute little town about two hours away right on the water where all the glitterati come into in the summer and <laughs> yeah so there's, there's a lot of a lot of wonderful places to see locally as well if so Um, so many beautiful places to see around the area um elise has to dash off now and we'll just we'll let you go elise if you want to say goodbye yeah i've got i've got an appointment with becky (laughs) plotner you guys have all heard of her she is my mentor in the u.s amazing so i'm off to have a chat to her okay well you have fun and we will chat to you soon and and lucy and i will finish off talking about the retreat <laughs> thank you oh lucy Take I care, and i'll see you, see you in italy in five yeah, and a half months very to lucy after chatting to you i think yeah. Elizabeth will too. it's just yeah to start taking those little steps and yeah see you in italy i'm so excited yeah Yay. can't wait it's gonna be cool. fabulous tell see becky you hi for us <laughs> will do <laughs> okay see ya hi. um so where were we lucy we'll just quickly finish off talking about the retreat for those of um, listening who would be interested in coming yeah um, so there's um, a lot to do in the area you were saying um, and I reckon like it's such a great idea having the retreat running from Monday to Friday because then they can really um, visit different places both weekends either side if they wanted to and that, use that for travel time as well exactly and we'll get to as you know we as we've discussed we'll get to visit the little local areas, the, mm. a bunch of the local Together. villages, mm. go to go to a market or two markets or whatever it may be, do, mm. do lots of lovely walking. And so we'll yeah. get, they'll definitely get, you know, a, a nice time outside during yes. the five days that they're learning and some real intensive um, training on yeah. how to, how to reset and how to start feeling good again and healthy again. And, yeah. Be energized. And, and we'll be cooking together. Um, so it's a small, it's a small select group. <laughs> yeah. Six yeah. bedrooms. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and there's uh, a couple that live on the property, Bianca. No, they don't live they don't okay. live there actually. They they're there from they're there from early to from from early to the end. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So did you say Bianca's a chef? Um, Bianca does exactly she cooks for all of our um, clients that we have there during the ski season so we we basically realized that we're now living here and we're not living in Europe and we're still not using the house as much as we'd like to Mm -hmm. and we started to get a lot of requests for um, for skiing in Italy because there's no luxury luxury chalets in Italy so we thought you know what actually whilst we're far away um, and whilst we've got the amazing Bianca and Pietro to look after our guests, why don't we um, turn this into a little mini business in the winter? So we do, you know, we do really well out of renting it through the winter season. Um, mm. And um, and so, yeah, this is something to something to try that's completely different um, for the during the spring season. Or the this season. is uh, um, if you're listening to this podcast and the um, retreat is not going to work for you or it's already happened because people listen to old podcasts. Um, You want to look into ski seasons too. Yep. Mm. Or the next year's podcast because we hope it's the next year's retreat. 
Yes. The next, sorry, the next cruise retreat. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, yeah, and all of the details are on on, um, on the website, which is um, so the house is that this kind of house is called a baita, which um, means stone farmhouse in mm. Italian. Um, and so the house is called Baita 1697. 1697 is the year that it was built. And mm-hmm. so it's www.baita1697.com. Um, and you can get in contact with me through that um, mm. or see any availability for what we're up to. So exciting. Um, definitely click through and at least look at the photos because if you're interested in natural building, um, creating yeah. a beautiful environment. And one of the things I love about how you describe it, Lucy, um, people get into the health space and think it's like, tell me, um, tell the listeners what you, what you told me about how gaps doesn't have to be all fat and broths and the building right, doesn't right, have right. to be. <laughs> well, there you go. I mean, you, I was explaining to my chiropractor earlier that I was coming to do a, cod, a podcast cod, podcast, <laughs> and I was explaining about your book and I was like, yeah, someone who's sexied up gaps. I love it. <laughs> she, she knew, she knew all about gaps. Um, yeah. I mean, we, um, I, I obviously came to interior design through fashion and so aesthetics and designs always been my interest. Um, and, um, and then came to natural building afterwards. So I sort of arrived into the world of natural building with quite a strong high end, um, design aesthetic behind me. And, um, so yeah, within the first year that the lodge was actually featured in architectural digest, we had a photographer come up and do the photos and, um, and it was, it's been featured all over since then. So haven't yeah, had, haven't you had Jamie like, Oliver stay like there? It's proof. Yeah, we had Jamie Oliver stay Ooh. with a bunch of friends and a whole load of other people that I probably shouldn't really declare online. I know that Jamie was fine <laughs> saying it out loud. Um, but uh, yeah, no, Pretty a lot exciting. of other a lot of other celebrities as well who um, wow. I think prefer to remain unknown. And that's the great thing about this place is that mm. it is totally private. off the beaten track. You yeah, can private remain quiet. Unknown. Yeah. Um, it's going back to roots and that I think is exactly what we're hoping to do with the retreat. And so location just fitted so perfectly with the whole idea of getting our hands dirty back in the soil that nourishes us. Um, And, you know, I went off, I went off track there. Sorry. Um, The, um, the gaps and the building and making it luxury. um, Did you want to just quickly finish talking about that sorry that's okay um so uh, I think it was just you said to me once um I just want people to be able to cook this way and eat this way without feeling like it has to be all yeah right but then when it comes to building biology you know to have a healthy home doesn't mean it has to be straw bales and <laughs> exactly, exactly. It can, I mean, it helps when it's a stone house in the mountains of Italy mm-hmm. because it's already architecturally beautiful and natural. Yes. Um, but no, it doesn't. I mean, my house in Concord is proof of that as well. It doesn't have to be all, yeah, exactly. It doesn't have to be like a little house with gnomes out the front. <laughs> um, <laughs> it can, it can be a beautiful, stunning, elegant property. And, mm. At the end of the day, my take on it um, and the interviews that I've been doing recently with these very luxurious magazines is, isn't this the ultimate in luxury mm-hmm. to have beauty, design, you know, elegant design and health together? Isn't that what yeah. we would all want in life in a perfect world? Mm. Uh, so I'm hoping, I'm trying to prove to the world that this is possible, that we yes. can get both of these and it's totally acceptable to demand both of them. And I'm trying to take it to my fellow interior designers and architects and builders and say, guys, this is our responsibility. We yeah. have to look after the people we're building for and we have to look after the planet at the same time. We can't do just one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Well, on that note, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and I absolutely cannot wait until june <laughs> yeah, it's going to be amazing yeah. um you if you can just let our listeners know where to find you you did mention the beta website but also instagram yeah so i have my um i have my interior and building biology instagram page which is lucy mccullough interiors and that's spelled i'll put the link 
Okay, so I don't yeah, need to spell it out. No, I don't worry. I'll put the link. Uh, Scroll down, guys. Click on it. Like her page. <laughs> yeah, please come visit. Talk to yeah. me. Ask me questions about building biology. I love it. Keeps my brain in it. Now that I finished my studies and I'm certified, I need to keep on the ball. <laughs> I'm going to ask you lots of questions. Yeah. So, where's the best place for people to contact you if they want to ask a question? Um, through Instagram works or through the uh, through the um, Biter1697 website. I also have my own website for the interiors, which is lucymccullough.com. Um, so any 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 of those options work. Okay. Yep. There's great. a contact in all of those places. So, yeah, feel free. Okay, great. And you are about to have a baby, though. So you may be offline. <laughs> yes, you may be offline. I will be offline for 30 days. It was 40 the other day. Now it's going down to 40. <laughs> <laughs> well, I still think that's pretty amazing. Good on you. I'm going to try. That's my goal. That's my goal. I'm reading the um, first 40 days cookbook, which oh. is just marvelous because it's basically gaps for postpartum. Oh. Oh, um, I'm going to have to look that one up. Every recipe, every recipe I'm reading, I'm like, this is amazing. This is, this is another gaps recipe. This is another gaps recipe. So, oh, that's so when, cool. when the world comes together like that, it's, it, yeah. it, you feel like you're doing the right thing. Yeah, you're on the right track. <laughs> on the right track, exactly. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, guys, I'm sure you would have been inspired by this podcast. Sorry it was so long, but I'm not sorry because it was awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Lucy, for taking all that time out of your evening. Oh, well, um, thanks for having me. Oh, we loved it. And I will put the links that we need below, but feel free to email me at help at quirkycooking.com.au if you have any other questions about the podcast, the retreat, anything we talked about, and I can always forward them on to Lucy if I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Thanks, thanks for having so me, Joe. Take care. You too. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 This has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com. Check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch. Subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter. The Wellness Couch, streaming wellness into your lives. Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.